In this video, I'm going to start adding multiplayer support to the game that I've been creating. We'll be looking at start locations when a player joins, as well as how to replicate player movement. I'll be building off the Flybot project that I've created in previous videos. There's a link for these down below, as well as a link to all the project files on GitHub. In the last video, I gave a high-level overview of how networking and multiplayer works in Unreal Engine by using Fortnite as an example. I also highly suggest checking out this video by Alex Forsyth, where he covers multiplayer and network replication. And of course, the Unreal Engine documentation has a great section on networking. We left off the Flybot project with the main parts of the level built and being able to fly around with our pawn. To test this as a multiplayer game, we'll first click on the three dots next to the play button. This contains settings for how to play your game while in the editor. We can set the number of players to use for testing, as well as the net mode. Up until now, we've been using standalone mode, which means no multiplayer support. There's also a listen server, which means one of the clients also runs the server. There's also a client option, which means run a dedicated server in the background and all clients will connect to that. If you click on advanced settings, there's a lot more options you can change while playing in the editor. We won't need any of these yet, but it's good to know that they're there in case you want to tweak how you test in the editor. For now, we're going to set our number of players to 2 and change our net mode to client. This will create one instance of the world running as a dedicated server, and then create two clients that connect to that server. When we hit play, we'll see one client starts in our main window, and another client starts in a new pop-up window. As you can see, things are pretty broken. Each window should have its own pawn, and be able to see the other pawn in the game. Instead, the camera for the small client seems to be inside one of the pawn static meshes. And in the main window, when you fly around, you don't see the other pawn at all. To figure out what's going on, let's hit escape to stop the test, and then look in our output log window. As you can see, one of the pawns was not able to spawn because of a collision at the spawn location. This happens because we're using a static mesh component for our collision, but it looks like the engine spawn collision adjustment code only works with sphere or capsule collision components. One thing we can do is change our spawn collision handling method for our pawn. This tells the engine what to do when it detects a collision, and in our case, we're going to set it to always spawn. If we build it, run it, and hit play, we can see both pawns now spawn, but they're overlapping each other. They're a bit tangled up and it takes a while to get them free. This is happening because they're sharing the same player start location. Player starts are invisible actors that tell the game where to spawn pawns for the world. For a network game, we're going to want separate player spawns for each player that connects to the game. But right now we only have one. If we take a look at the choose player start implementation for the game mode base class, we can see it loops over all player start actors for the world, checks to see if the pawn can fit, and depending on that outcome, puts it either on an occupied or unoccupied list, and then tries to assign it an unoccupied point before an occupied point. Because we're using a static mesh component for our pawn's collision component, this blocking geometry call is always failing, so we need to add some custom code for our start point assignment. We can do this by overriding some functions in our game mode class. In flybotgamemode.h, we'll first declare additional overrides for our pre-login and init new player functions, and also add a private array to track the player start points. In flybotgamemode.cpp, we'll first add some new code to init game that finds all the player starts in our world, and then saves them in our free player starts array. Next, we'll define the override for our pre-login function. This is only used for servers to make sure an incoming network connection is allowed. If we don't have any free player starts available, we'll return an error saying the server's full. Next, we'll define the override for our init new player function. We'll first double check there's a free player start in case there's a race condition between pre-login and this function. We'll pop a free player controller off the list and then assign this to the start spot in our controller. If start spot is set, the engine uses this instead of trying to find one on its own. At the top of this file, we'll also need to include some additional headers for the new code. If we build it, run it, and hit play, it looks like both clients connect, but they actually don't. One of these clients failed to connect because the server only has one player start. The client that failed doesn't show any error messages in the rendered window, and instead just loads the default map. If we look in the output log, we can see the no free player starts error message, and that the network connection was closed. To fix this, we'll create a second player start in our level. When we hit play, we can now see both pawns being spawned on the server. We can verify this by going to the output log, searching for log flybot, and seeing our new log messages that assign the player starts to the controllers. The next thing we need to fix is the replication for our pawn movement. When we move a pawn in one window, we don't see it move in the other. If we take a look at the constructor for the pawn class, which is the base class for our flybot pawn, we can see it's set to replicate as well as replicate the movement. With movement replication enabled, any time this replicated movement structure changes on the server, a new copy is sent down to all the clients. 
The clients then run this unrep replicated movement function, which handles moving the pawn around. So it looks like replication should be working from the server to the client. We can confirm this by going into our play settings menu and changing it from play as client to play as listen server. This will instead run the server on one of the client instances and not spawn a dedicated server. I'm also going to change it so both clients spawn new windows instead of using the existing viewport. This will make it easier to see both clients at once. If we move the pawn in the client window, which we can see labeled at the top, it doesn't move on the server. But if we move the client that's on the listen server, we can see it move on the other client. This is because the listen server sees that replicated movement variable change and sends it down to the client. The server doesn't see the movement from the client because this type of variable replication only works from the server to the client. The only way the client can send something back to the server is through an RPC or remote procedure call. By default, the pawn actor and the floating pawn movement component don't make any RPCs back to the server when it detects movement. If we were using a humanoid pawn and using the character class and the character movement component, this would take care of all the client to server network RPCs for us. It actually has quite a bit of functionality built into it for client side prediction and server correction. I recommend reading through this documentation if you want to learn more about how it works. Since we're not using this, we need to make the client to server RPC ourselves. We'll open up flybotplayerpawn.h and declare a new server RPC called update server transform. We declare it as a U function and pass in the server specifier. This means it can be called on the client but run on the server. We also pass in the unreliable specifier because we don't care if some of the updates don't make it back to the server. We're going to be calling this constantly from the tick function to update our movement, so if a few get dropped due to network issues, it's no big deal. Next, at the end of our tick function in flybotplayerpawn.cpp, we'll check to see if our role is autonomous proxy. This means that we're running as a client, but we're in charge of controlling this pawn. If this is the case, we send our most recent transform to the server. Next, we define the server implementation for update server transform. So now when the server receives an updated transform from the client, it can update its copy of the actor, which then gets propagated down to all the other clients. There's one other thing we can do. At the top of the tick function, we'll check to see if we're a dedicated server. If so, we'll just return because we can skip all the animation code and the RPC check. If we build it, run it, and hit play, we can now see that movement from each client is visible in all copies of the game. While this works, there is actually one big problem with it. The client moves the pawn in its copy of the game based on the user's input, and then sends the new location to the server. The server then sets the pawn's new location, trusting that the client was correct. If the client didn't have an up-to-date copy of the world from the server, or if the client is cheating, you could end up with some pretty weird behavior. The server should verify that the client move is valid based on its copy of the world, and if it's not, it should reject the move and correct the client. Again, this is something that the character movement component takes care of for you if you're using the character actor. In the next video, I'll add some server verification code as well as show how to test multiplayer games outside of the editor. This will allow us to see what issues can pop up when the server and client tick rates differ. If you have any questions, be sure to ask in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.